Hey, everybody. Welcome back to You Are What You Love. I am your host, Marissa Tandon, and my guest today is uh, the type of guy who makes stuff for your ears. It's a good, it's a good show to... <laughs> good guest to have that on. Uh, he's a musician and a podcast producer and a pal of mine. So please welcome Travis Reeves to the show. Hi. Thank you. That's that's going on. If I ever have a business card again, which why would we? But if I do, it's going to be a per- person who makes stuff for your ears. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Right? I think that's, uh, I mean, it's the truth, technically speaking. Yeah. And I'll go to like, you know, like a jewelry convention and just like be the person that's like, why did you, that's isn't, you obviously don't mean what I think this means. Why are you doing this? Yeah. yeah. I kind of like that though. Like I like the idea of a musician finding new clients at a, <laughs> <laughs> at a jewelry. Convention. Yeah. I came here for earrings and I left with a great song. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Um, all right. Well, with that being said, Travis, what are we, what are we talking about today? What's the thing that changed who you are as a person? The thing that changed who I am as a person fundamentally uh, is the National Basketball Association. The NBA. I love it. Um, it is our first sport that we are bringing on to the show. Yes. Um, but I'm very, <laughs> very excited. Buckle about up, it, nerds. I know. I'm very excited about it because In high school, I always said that if people understood the fandom behind basketball, they would be obsessed with it. Even if you don't understand, basket goes in hoop. Basketball goes in hoop. See, I already don't know. Um, (laughs) um, So, I when when was the first time you watched a basketball game? Do you remember? Wow. Um, So, being from the Bay Area, I was you know uh, like societally relevant in like the we believe year the 0708 um mm. you know eight one seed upset but i wasn't really tapped into basketball i wasn't really like that into sports that that like football casually just because my family were big uh raider fans i would go to games but um i tapped in in the 2015-16 season which categorically makes me a bandwagoner and that's okay i can live with that i think that's okay though i think um the nba at that time period is a little bit more about the player than the team i feel yeah but i don't know that everyone feels the same way about that yeah, it feels like an interesting changing of the guard. And if anybody's listening to this who is in any way an NBA head, this is not news. But like it's that just post Heatles LeBron, like coming into the proliferation of the Golden State dynasty that would run the NBA for the next four years. And again, last year. Yeah, they have returned to return to take their throne, I suppose. Heck yeah. So being from the Bay Area, that would be for those listening who are not uh, the most NBA savvy the Golden State Warriors would be your team. That is correct. I am geographically predisposed to like the Golden State Warriors. And boy, did I pick a great time to tap in. <laughs> is your family like you mentioned that they're Raiders fans, but is your family like a big Golden State Warriors household? No, my parents were never really that big into sports uh, outside of like casual viewership. Um, my I have like an aunt and an uncle who are Warriors fans for sure. But base sorry, basketball is probably their third sport behind football and then baseball so I sort of had to I found it not had to but I did I found it independently so did you how did you find like what what made you I feel like I've been to the Bay Area one time Mm -hmm. while the Golden State Warriors were in the playoffs and it was very intense like I watched a game in the bar was this something that you kind of explored because the town like the town the city of hey back in (laughs) Oakland that's the town yeah it is the town you're right town business um you know what? It's on the T-shirts, so I am gonna I'm gonna stick by what I said Absolutely. first. Um, was it something that you found because of the town being so plugged into it, or was it something that you? How did you end up going? Now is the time. It was certainly prevalent. Um, I remember the 2015 finals when they won their first ring in 30 odd years, and mm-hmm. I was at the gym, and it was a finals game, and every single television in this gym was tuned to this Warriors finals game, and I was like. Wow, this is a whole thing, isn't it? And <laughs> really, not until that off season, and I can't remember exactly what did it. I know part of it was just getting NBA 2K16 mm. and just finding this thing that was like a fun arcade game. I think it was like I think it'd be fun to play this basketball game. I'm a big fan of in terms of like any kind of gaming I've done, like arcade experiences. Not necessarily the physical place, but like Burnout 3, Mortal Kombat, like just repeatable 
uh, Super Smash, Mario Kart. Like, yeah, I don't don't give me a story, please. I don't have time <laughs> for that. I you like a like a forty minute gaming experience? Exactly. Yeah, I want something yeah. that I can just get better at mechanically. And hmm. um, and two K was that, and a lot of fun. And it happened at a time where everything just started to come into focus in terms of like basketball, like awareness in the area. You know, it was like the start mm -hmm. of a new dynasty. And then that next season, the regular season that started, the Warriors came out and what they went twenty four straight. They went twenty four and zero. Something yeah, like that. I think that was their big season where they literally just went undefeated. Yeah, and yeah. at that point, I had also gotten into just uh, illegally streaming sports. <laughs> football the season before and I was like well these games are cool and exciting and I was just starting to kind of get a feel for like what the game is and there was just this like it's like the most compelling television show of season premiere of a television show I've ever seen in my life mm. you know because you have these games that are going down to the I remember specifically it was in a it was a regular season game I think it was like the 20th win in a row they had they they beat the Atlanta Hawks I think in the I think it was a buzzer beater or something in the closing seconds and it was this idea of like you know they could lose a game, it was fine, but like they were on this like historic streak coming out of the gate. And I was just like glued to my bed watching television and being like, this is the only thing that matters in this moment. Yeah. Did you um did you play basketball before, like growing up? No, God no. No. <laughs> no, I uh, am so uncoordinated. It's hilarious. Okay. Yeah. So were you like a sports kid at all? Or was, so you're anti sport growing up and eventually they just get you? Uh I would even say necessarily anti-sport. I played like one year of football as a kid. I'd play like at school, you know, I liked PE. Mm -hmm. Sports were always fun. I just never did organize sports. Um, sure. So, you know, it was just something that I was a fan of and then happened to find like the captivating sport for me at the right time. Well, so you were in the Bay Area, which is a great place to love sports, yes. especially basketball. Yes. What else was going on in your life? Because you're not in the Bay Area now, no. which <laughs> <laughs> down here in L.A. So what else was going on when you when you clicked in? Guessing what smoked me out down to Southern California. Yeah. Yeah. What was like, <laughs> I have to leave. <laughs> I, have, I need to get the fuck out of here. I love this team. But um, no, this actually brings up a um, I think an important uh hinge of uh, my relationship with the NBA is that 2015-16, which was my last year in the Bay Area, was one of a lot of growth, arti growth artistically and personally, and also a whole lot of crap going on, like a whole lot of like mm. trauma and like <laughs> <inner> personal problems. <laughs> that, um, what was great about the NBA, and this actually follows a pattern that I have as a human being where I will find like a thing a topic, a subject, a practice, a hobby, and I will just really learn the crap out of it. I will research it. I will. I just want as much context as I could possibly um, possibly hold. And then, you know, maybe I'll phase out of it and find a new thing. Um, what was great about the NBA in a particularly troubling and trying period of my life, while still being like a pretty productive one, was no matter how much I invested in it, it didn't ask anything of me. Mm. It just was something that offered limitless, repeatable potential and scratched, you know, in the abstract, every kind of itch for like a piece of content I would want to consume. It was real. It was uh, that almost in the same way, like with playing 2K, like that arcade feel of you have this repeatable thing and you have these like larger than life personalities and storylines that exist not even within the context of the game they're playing. But, you know, outside of that, you start learning about things like uh, the cap and like contract squeezes and like, you know, and personal accolades and how that plays into stuff. And it just starts to build this mass network that if you feel like disassociating, like from your own life, it's just <laughs> bottomless, <laughs> bottomless fries. All oh my it's great. Goodness. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, some of the stuff, a lot of people think the NBA in particular is just like 10 dudes on the court throwing the basketball around but that has that doesn't even get into half of what loving the NBA is oh, about it's imagine every year your favorite anime comes back and it's only a tournament arc <laughs> yeah yeah I think and then you've got like are you a post conference post game conference like trading trade season draft season kind of person who obsesses over that I am an absolute simp for for the uh, off the court ecosystem of the NBA it has just eaten so much of my free time 
<laughs> um, yeah, no, that's I think is half the fun, and that's where you it almost becomes like this extended universe where if you really want to understand all the threads that make the game itself so compelling, mm -hmm. you know, it behooves one to learn and get to know about these people as people and like all their business dealings. Like, how else would you be able to fully comprehend the drama of Russell Westbrook's agent after like 15 years of like a rock solid partnership being like, this guy doesn't know how to chill. So I'm yeah. not going to be his agent anymore because he won't come off the bench and you know what fine screw this like publicly which no agent has done before and right like, these little tiny things that fire off and you're just like this is so entertaining <laughs> oh my god <laughs> yeah i love the way you're describing because it it's almost like the way people talk about the marvel cinematic universe like if you really want to understand it you yeah. have to get into the old comics you have to like you have to know everything but you kind of don't have to worry about it being good or not because it's real yeah it's real people it's real sports yeah yeah, I think um, there's an element, too, of the drama of it mm. connecting to kind of superhuman talent yes. of real human beings. That is, it cannot go without saying that you're also watching sh human potential at, like, maximize in a mm. very specific few areas. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, like, there's something really fascinating about watching people, and they play, like, it's an insanely long season plus the postseason. Right. I think the only season longer is baseball, right? Yeah, the baseball's um, 160 games, but you know they're standing around most of the time. Yeah, I don't. I you know more power to baseball, but I, <laughs> I wouldn't say they're um, uh, sprinting in the same way that you are for basketball. Basketball is a 40 minute genuine peak performance. Yeah, I think by and large, unless you're LeBron on defense in the regular season. I, I'm predisposed to sports hate him, but I, 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 the man has, has earned everything that he has, by and large. Yeah. You know what? This brings up a great point about the NBA and about NBA fans, too, I think. Yeah. Because as much as they're real people, there's like an extreme level of having to deal with people hating you for no reason other than the jersey that you're wearing. Yeah. Like LeBron is objectively an amazing basketball player, yeah. but both you and I are like, fuck that guy. Fuck like that I don't guy. even, if I saw him on the street, I would cross the street. Like, <laughs> nah. <laughs> and, you're, and to say, to treat it with such platitude, there's like, no, he sucks. It's like, that's categorically untrue. Right. <laughs> like, Categorically incorrect. He's operating at a peak level yeah. of humanity and an amazing basketball Rarified player. But there are genetic air and also to realize that potential to its fullest extent is like that's incredible. The man does poetry in motion. And you're like, fuck him. Yeah. Trash. I absolutely hate him as a human being. And it's that but I think it comes back to what you're talking about. These are actual human beings right. that you're do you feel like it has there is such a level of celebrity to it, mm -hmm. which is I would say maybe different than the way people are people talk about movies where you can kind of separate the performance from the person. Yeah. Do you feel like there's a level of of lack of separation in being a sports fan? I think and this is something that's been pulled into the discourse over the past couple of years especially that um the general public looks to their athletes maybe more than they should to be thought leaders on specific subjects not to say that they're un unqualified any individual person but there's this like well what are you going to use your platform for and i think it's important to especially in a league like the nba to like be hard on messaging about inclusivity and like social justice which they have been to their credit mm -hmm. um however there could be room for more like recognition that these are men who have been playing only one sport most of their time since they were 11 at this point yeah. And like should not be maybe used as the ideological bar for society at, at large, if that makes sense. Yeah. Or even really expected to be to some degree. Yeah. Like, I think it's a level of some of these, not anymore really, but like especially but like before the requirement to go to take a year outside of high school before you can join the league, yeah. like LeBron, I think I some sports person is going to tell me that I'm absolutely wrong and flame me. But I think LeBron was like the last class of people that didn't have to go for a year off. So you're talking about people that came in at some of them 17 or 18 years old into an insane amount of money, mm -hmm. an insane amount of fame and an insane amount of talent and are being expected to go beyond what they signed up for, which is to play basketball. Yeah. 
And, you know, not even counting the societal pressures that come with that amount of celebrity and that amount of money. And that's where you hear about all these. And also, another thing about the NBA, the history is so deep and so interesting um, to get a sense of the development of the league and development of, like, how players have uh, changed both in the game and then how, like, the industry of the NBA has changed. Where you have, like, people like Gilbert Arenas, you know, and, like, all these mm -hmm. uh, 2000s players and from the Allen Iverson generation who you know, like we're sort of left to the wolves, so to speak, by like agents. And you have these unfortunate tales of like family members sort of eating them alive financially. And, you know, just a lot of yeah. non-regulated time out, away from the team. And these kids, they just let run wild with millions of dollars. And um, yeah, it's important to remember that like it's this, they've done a lot better putting the systems in place today to like have these kids come into the league more like full-grown emotionally competent adults but they're still a lot of them are like 19. <laughs> they're like a bunch of 19 year old kids yeah i don't think there's i think people are really some of them i guess would still be 18 because i think the requirement is you just have to be a year out of high school yeah which has done a lot to both help and hurt college basketball i would say yeah that that's neither here nor there i suppose the the idea is that like they're supposed to take a year to go do something that should, in theory, make them more mature, but it's still a year. And also, it's a year that you know you're going into the NBA. Yeah. <laughs> you're play yeah. And like, you know, you're not taking classes. Let's be real. No. You're getting paid. And like, and that's why this whole, you know, the G League night um, mm -hmm. and like all, and now it's kind of come this full circle where there are, it feels like there are more structured alternative paths to the NBA, yeah. which is neat. But um, yeah, the one and done is a sham. It's an yeah, absolute shit. For sure. Yeah, it's uh, a mess. But and I, I get I do think like it is attempting maybe to to deal with what we're talking about, which is that intense pressure at such a young age. But uh, it's still only a year. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So to try to put a pin on your actual question, um, it's that I'm always happy to be pleasantly surprised by the emotional intelligence of players in this league and officials and coaches and everybody. But if they fall short of what my ideal is. I'm not really going to hold it against them that much mm. unless it's like something, unless it's Kyrie. Yeah, yeah. so that's a little different, yeah. you know. Well, I also think you either by luck of it being the location that you were in or maybe this is part of what brought you in. I think the team that is your team has a level of really great personas off the court. Yeah. I think it's almost watching that Watching that team is almost like watching the original to bring it back to that idea of like the Avengers, yeah. that first phase one group <laughs> of actors that knew exactly what they were doing. Like, I feel the same way about if we run through the the core team, you've got uh, Draymond, you've got Steph, you've got Clay, and then back and forth, you've got Kevin Durant. I'm, yeah. ooh, that was a minute for me to get there somehow. <laughs> um, maybe I was still having trauma from him leaving. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, who is that guy? Um, but, and then on top of that, you've got a tall blank spot in my memory. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know him. I don't know him, I don't and know I don't want to know him. Uh, so, what is that a scarecrow? Um, I don't know what you're talking about. But yeah, but you've got so you've got these amazing, amazing guys that I always find myself wanting to call them the boys. Like they're grown men. They're you know, the, but they there's something really wonderful about them, and they have a great way of speaking on and off court. And I'm just curious how if any of that kind of drew you in, because I would say unless you disagree, I don't know that they've been disappointing people. No. Um... No, the most you can really get on them for, I think, is Draymond for being loud and a hypocrite and Clay for being pouty. But, you know, like if that's the if that's the worst, then all right, I'll take that. Sure. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think a lot of that stems from a really functional front office and coaching staff. Steve Kerr as the ideological leader of anything is something I'm for. Like he's a really, really good guy who I think has a great perspective on how the sport fits into life, both in the way that it can enhance a life and how it can also you know it doesn't matter like there's things outside of basketball that matter more and you see that in the way that he speaks to like last year and throughout his tenure as a coach and beyond that like he's been an outspoken advocate against gun violence mm -hmm. largely you know stemming from the fact that his father was killed by gun violence in a foreign country there's a great story by the way about him uh while playing at arizona state back in i think the late 80s when this happened um came under uh, some taunting from the other team around that. And it was, a, it was a real unfortunate situation. And, you know, as much as there are things outside of basketball, what does Steve Kerr do? 
he played that night and smoked them. Just absolutely ran them up and down the court. And it's like, that's great. And you have somebody who, in just my little Steve Kerr, like, uh, you know, love moment here, who has been through every version of an NBA career, you know, as, as not necessarily the lead role, but as somebody who's been able to see it all happen from being on the second three-peat Bulls, you know, famously the one to stand up to Michael Jordan in practice and get punched in the face for it from Michael Jordan. Um, being on the Popovich Spurs in the end of the early 2000s as like a end of the bench veteran and being an assistant, being a GM, being a, a color commentator, and then back as a head coach. Um, it's just cool to have somebody with that perspective who also was in a situation with the right kind of GM for the right time, a former agent who was big on player relationships, the right kind of owner who, you know, forward thinking, willing to take a chance on the organization and taking, you know, big swings from a team building perspective and an ideological perspective and then you know you get down to the people that that we know most the talent Steph a one of one generational superstar and you know high NBA pedigree his father played his brother plays uh, athletic family who seem to really have like a good sense of who they are and you know seem like really great people play my heart my soul <laughs> my favorite boy <laughs> A special little man. Um, and then, like you said, Draymond, like emotional engine. And then that whole cast, I'm just listing the names of players that are good now. But like, yeah, it's easy to root for. I also get how it's super easy to hate on. Like mm. a little too perfect, a little too convenient, a little like almost not rich kid syndrome. But like, yeah, yeah. When everything like works, of course, you're going to have a good time. But um, sure. As a new fan, incredibly easy to buy into. Yeah, but I also think you brought up a really good point with Steve Kerr, which is that it's not an accident that these guys ended up together and that it's not this like luck of the draw. They're all so good. And of course, everything's working out for them. It really is like a person who went through an insane career and really got the chance. Like, I'm really glad you mentioned um, his tenure with Michael Jordan, yeah. because I think a lot of people didn't know about that until um, until The Last Dance came out. That was really when a lot of people were like, oh, my God, Steve Kerr played basketball. Like some people <laughs> genuinely didn't know. <laughs> yeah, he was pretty great, too. Yeah, he was pretty good at it. Yeah. Um, and you get to watch, I think, The Last Dance um, is obviously slated to to make Michael Jordan look like the hero and to be the great person that uh, or great player and and perhaps doesn't talk about certain things like that. Michael Jordan's a dick, man, and that's okay. He is, but he's a great player. He's an incredible player. And I think it comes back to that same thing of whether you can acknowledge that these are real people and what it takes to operate at a peak level and then to recognize that there are certain people who are surrounded by the best and the best can't even touch them and what that would do to someone's mental state. Like, yeah. And I think um, I think Michael Jordan is always a great example of like what greatness does to a person and whether like how you respond to it. Yeah. Like they have all of those stories of, of him playing and being so much better than everyone in the league that they would make him play with one team for the first half of the scrimmage and then play against <laughs> his own score for the second half by switching teams. Um, because simply that was the only way for him to get better. Yeah. So I do wonder, like I think Steve Kerr is a cool example of, watching or being around someone that's at that level of greatness and then learning how to then manage people that come up in the same league of that same amount of talent yeah a real um and you know it's a specific style he's a he is a person you know and he tries very mm. much to present as a human being and builds his foundation you know of his team ideology like we are all as equal as we can be you know yeah in this and you see that in the play style and you know, if you ever want to see basketball at its offensive peak, watch highlights from the first Kevin Durant season and just the way four, arguably five, top 20 players in the league playing like an egalitarian, everybody everybody pitches in and everybody gets their moment style of basketball. It's dumbfounding. Yeah, I think um, something that is worth mentioning about this team as well is that like... <laughs> it's a Warriors episode now. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I know. It's <laughs> no, I think it's... But I think with, with the Warriors, like something that's so interesting is that when you look at other other teams that have these massive players mm -hmm. and huge egos mm -hmm. um like lebron's a great example of that like there is drama that follows that and it's rare that you even hear a whispering of rumors of drama from the warriors in terms of players against players yeah 
the worst it got was in that third KD year when he had eyes on, you know, another chapter in his career. There was that blowout that him and Draymond had because Draymond's a hothead down here at the Staples mm-hmm. Center um, in Los Angeles. And you're like, OK, this is wrong and bad. And even still in the fallout of all that, like it changed the course of the team. It changed the foundation of the league itself. Finally, the Warriors were dead. Mm-hmm. Spoiler alert, they're not. But, um, <laughs> you know, uh, and in the fallout, you hear all Steve Kerr and like the, the players on the team talk about are, you know, the worst it gets is like, yeah, doing this five times in a row is really friggin' hard. Mm. And it really grinds on you. Like, it wasn't fun, but they're not like, there's no like, fuck that guy. Yeah, I think even recently, um, Steph just talked about the fact that he was like, yeah, I would think if we can get KD back, we should. Like, there's yeah. no bad blood. We'd love to. Yeah, and at the same time, while being like, we're good without him, you know, it's cool. Yeah, it's, it, it sounds, for anybody who's like, outside of the NBA listening to this, maybe think like, so you're saying that they're like decent people. And like, it's not that that's weird, <laughs> but it is just, it's the same way in a fandom. You're like, oh, uh, Chris Evans is like, a, like went to like a hospital. That's fucking great. Now I'm even more of a fan of him. Not, I mean, to visit somebody, not because he got hurt. That, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? <laughs> no, visiting kids. And, yeah. yeah. Like the little things. Yeah. I think maybe a great way to illustrate that to people who don't understand um, or don't have maybe as much knowledge about the NBA mm-hmm. is um, the idea of the salary cap and what that means for certain players being able to be on a team. Yeah. So basically in the NBA, there is a, a cap of the amount of money that you can spend on your salaries with teams. It's meant to uh, sort of keep teams from putting every superstar on one team and then that team wins the whole league because how could you beat every single amazing player at one time? Yeah. Um, I.e. the New York Yankees in baseball as an example, if anybody's trying to make Yes, you can just do what you want there. Um, So with that, it means that a lot of times there's not a... the you can't put every player that you'd want to on a team. And a team like the Golden State Warriors working out in a modern space means that someone didn't get the money that they may have deserved or wanted. Mm -hmm. Um, And we're talking about insane amounts of money. I should (laughs) should put it out there. They're good. They Um, they can cover rent. They're they're good. Yeah, they're doing all right. Um, (laughs) They're doing just fine. It's just not as much as uh, perhaps they, their talent would, would recommend within the rest of the league. And, um, and Steph's a great example of that yeah. is that to be able to make the team a championship team, he could have sort of demanded and and earned and and received a salary that made him the only massive player on the team. Yeah. But in taking a lower amount of money, he was able to open up the team for players that w- allowed them to become the dynasty that they are. Mm-hmm. And to set a precedent, there's a great article that um, Bill Simmons wrote prior to the Warriors dynasty kicking off in 2015 called, I think, 72 Ways to Piss Off a Fan Base that details okay. the history of the Golden State Warriors' absolute ineptitude up to that point. Mm-hmm. And to have it pivot so hard from decades of floundering and disappointment to unprecedented success, there was a lot of stuff that just had to kind of go right and it was almost magic. To kind of tie this back to something a little bit earlier, the reason that I think I'm in the NBA so much now is because it was literally one of the most compelling situations someone could possibly have as their introduction to the NBA outside of like the Jordan Bulls starting. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's such a good point with kind of talking about the NBA in general and how it's changed. Yeah. I think it's been a bit since someone has been a cultural touch point in the way that Michael Jordan was. Yeah. Um, like I think if you, even if you don't, know anything about basketball if you never watched a basketball game in your life if someone if you stopped someone on the street and asked what number was Michael Jordan you probably would get the right answer yeah um so I think it's cool to see I don't want to say history repeating itself because I don't know that it that you can ever get the same level of intensity and same level of league that you had back then Mm -hmm. um but I do think the Warriors at that time were probably the closest we've gotten to it being that well known. Yeah. And I think particularly as a team, because obviously mm-hmm. the counter argument, not that it's even a counter argument, but someone would say, well, what about LeBron? It's like, yes, as a singular individual, as a almost Christ-like representative of the NBA. But yeah, in terms of like a, uh, not, not that it's better or worse, but a more holistic like team-based experience, that sure. 15 to 18 Warriors team um, though supercharged with the addition of KD, 15 mm-hmm. to 19, is, uh, 
it, yeah, it's it's that much. And now that I, I'm fully in it, the summer of 2015-16, the 73 and nine season, the three one comeback in the Western Conference Finals, and then the three one loss for anybody who doesn't know uh nba playoffs are played in series so like a baseball the there's seven game series for each round so you have to win four of seven in order to advance and um i was in a community production of american idiot in el cerrito it, it, <laughs> it, uh, bad show not a good not even a show really no plot to that show <laughs> i don't anyways um and i was in probably the most nonsense I've been in in my entire life from like a theater drama perspective. I'm not entirely proud of it, um, but it was like a really like tumultuous, traumatic period of my life for reasons that shouldn't have existed, but it was. And I cannot tell you how compelling it was to have these moments like game six clay against the thunder. Yeah. And even prior to that in the regular season, like I remember doing like laundry and being like, yeah, I'll just throw on the Warriors Thunder game like, you know, in January. And that's the overtime game where Andre hits two. Andre Godal hits two of the clutches free throws in the history of NBA NBA regular seasons. And then Steph hits the shot The yeah. they have a timeout. They refuse. They decide not to take it. Curry from way downtown and then the double bang. And I'm sitting there like with my underwear in my hand being like <laughs> mouth agape. And then, then like three weeks earlier, there's the clay against the Pacers, 60 points on nine dribbles game. And just like it's in real life, you get these Avengers assemble moments. Yeah. And it just endears the shit out of you to these people because you can see greatness any night of the week. <laughs> yeah, I think so. The regular season of basketball is something that people a lot of times don't watch. Yeah. Like a lot of people tune in for the playoffs, which of course is like the peak performance of peak players and athletes of in America. And, and it's amazing. But the a lot of people neglect the regular season, which has all of these amazing moments mm -hmm. of getting to watch that level of what you're talking about and that excitement. Yeah. I remember in, in the the highs and the lows there was the in that same season uh the warriors had won every single home game because they were on their mm -hmm. way to a a uh, a historical 73 and 9 win record in the regular season and the celtics beat them and i remember mm -hmm. sitting at home on the edge of my fucking seat and unlike a lot of narrative content they lost you know mm -hmm. and it's like oh this sucks and i remember you know the day that that awful production of American Idiot closed and it was put behind me <laughs> and I was just this emotionally drained wreck. I yeah. got home, got a burrito and watched the Warriors lose game seven, lying on my couch, basically <laughs> despondent. Not like in despair, but just like, yeah, it tracks. Okay. <laughs> and like that to me in a, and as meaningful and, mm. And that and what really uh, speaks to that for me personally and what has like I was already in the tank forever. And this, of course, leads you to learn about the league itself. And again, my it's become my disassociative hobby. I listen to analytics podcasts to go to sleep. I'm way too acutely aware of like the cap situation of the Charlotte Hornets this year. And like I, it's a problem. <laughs> I have a problem. <laughs> but the 2019 finals, the mm -hmm. the the last, you know, the, the last ride, so to speak. Um, Kevin Durant has like a high ankle sprain or like is, is an Achilles injury that he then comes back for and tears his Achilles in the finals, which was the Golden State Warriors against the Kawhi Leonard led Toronto Raptors. The one season Kawhi is on the Raptors. And man, if I, ugh, I ended up watching the game seven Eastern Conference finals, like the final, the waning moments of it outside of a TV store in Glendale. And it was just like 15 people standing there watching the <laughs> shot go in, the quadruple bounce. And like, just I cannot communicate the drama of closing seconds of the game, game seven, you know, Jimmy Butler, Ben Simmons, Joel Embiid versus Kawhi Leonard, Kyle Lowry, Fred Van Vliet after trading DeMar DeRozan, Kyle Lowry's best friend of this big emotional exercise. And like, everything's like, oh, it's so much drama. And to have Kawhi jack a, jack a shot up and it bounce off the rim four times and go in and then to see like no one likes seeing Drake that happy but whatever <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely um yeah I think I think uh something that you touched on that I really like is the idea that it is not written yeah so it's like peak drama peak experience but there actually is a real possibility that thing your heroes can lose yeah um 
and there's no real villains. There's the villain that you've chosen, right. whatever your association is, but there's an entire um an entire city of people rooting for that side too. Yeah. So there's do you think especially like what the time that you're talking about it being able to sort of mirror real life in a different way than maybe movies or TV or the Avengers give you that escapism? This is, hmm, yes, I think so. And I think particularly in the throes of the pandemic, the way the NBA was able to mm -hmm. bounce back and do the Disney bubble where they all camped out in Orlando, uh, most of the teams at least, except for the losers that weren't invited, like the Warriors that year, coincidentally. <laughs> um, and, you know, have this like kind of weird isolated singular experience and like you hear about all the COVID stuff they're going through and like you hear about one of the guys getting suspended because it got postmates and you can't do that because he broke quarantine and like that's the thing where it's like oh this is it became like a big brother almost like a reality mm. show and um there's a human element to it but i i do have to say it i keep coming back to this idea that like yeah it's anime like mm -hmm. that to me is that like to pull uh, a more culturally uh, relevant anime recently, like the My Hero Academia tournament arc from like season two, mm -hmm. where it's like, you like these characters. These are characters you like. You are fans of all of them, but they got to yeah. fight each other and you're going to have a stake in it. And then it's over and it's like, I'm really upset that I lost, but I don't hate you or whatever. Right. And it's this, um, you know, that is their job is to do that. I guess in that sense, it it kind of hits me. I end up on the living two lives at once where it feels so intensely narrative but at the same time I, it is real and it is reflective of real life in that these are real people's jobs money careers and we interact with them and that um more than ever to a degree that's probably a little much but like yeah it reflects in the way that you see like kobe bryant dies and the whole season's different mm -hmm. and it, things are just different now because of that in the nba and you know um throughout like the throughout the bubble at the one of the like heights of civil unrest like black lives matter protests like the bucks don't come out for a game like we're not playing this game you mm -hmm. know until like we talk about this or even the the rudy gobert game when mm. in the you know the the day the season the league shut down rudy gobert gives a press conference where he's an idiot and like essentially plays off coronavirus is not a big deal and touches every microphone on his way out on purpose. And then hours the next day, I think, test positive for coronavirus and they shut down a Thunder Jazz game. Bef like they're like, you all need to leave right now. Everybody yeah. in the building, get the fuck out. <laughs> and then the league closed for like eight months. Yeah. Yeah, and it's some of those moments, like that Rudy Gobert moment is a moment that you simply couldn't have written. Yeah. Like, no one could have come up with that. Yeah. No one could come up with someone being that much of an idiot. Like, <laughs> like only in Veep, the HBO series, right. do you, can you hope for something as dumb as that going on? Yeah, it really, that is the closest I would say that you could ever have. Um, because it's not even satire. It's like, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> like, <laughs> and then, like, you know what happened three years later? And not just because of that. It's because, like, you know, they couldn't, defend in the playoffs like and now that jazz team's broken up and like it all yeah that felt like the first little crack of this thing that eventually led to the jazz selling their team off for scrap yeah yeah i i think something that's pretty cool about it is like as we talk about this i think there's so much to explore and be a fan of yeah. and there is an extreme element of fandom that i think maybe people don't necessarily um don't necessarily connect that it's fandom because objectively there's not as many of people that you would necessarily think of as fandom people sure. that are fans of basketball. Um, but it is like uh, to be able to talk to people about it and realize like, nope, everybody experiences something in the same way that people talk about Tumblr or fan fiction or that level. And also not to spoil it, but there's fan fiction written about these people. <laughs> like there is shipping in the it, it, there is a dark hole you can go down in the Internet um, Woo! of this. <laughs> there's a lot going on. Um, but but from that, I mean, it's a it's a less traditional way that you would think about fandom but an extreme fandom experience i would say well to to touch on that that idea of fan fiction um in i think a, a roundabout way 
And also, actually, to talk about fandom, when you think about the, the the quintessential idea of a sports crowd, you know, people faces painted, like screaming, like what is fandom if not this? In fact, right. this may be the loudest public fandom sports that is that that exists before, especially mm -hmm. before the advent of conventions. But conventions don't have a season. Well, they kind of have a season, but like Comic Con isn't every Sunday for seventeen weeks, right? You know. Um, but in fan fiction, the NBA, I think in particular, invites so much speculation on what ifs. Kevin Durant. Mm -hmm. well, what if the Warriors win in 16? Does Kevin Durant not go there? What happens? Does mm -hmm. he go to the Celtics? Does he go to the Wizards? Like there is fan fiction written about the NBA and its discourse. I think half of the NBA media is predicated on prediction or theoretical physics of like, what if this had happened instead of that? Yeah. And that is where you can get into some really um, compelling stuff because it's just the Again, the amazing thing about it is it's real, like, people. Well, I think it brings up things like, you know, like, fantasy leagues. Yeah. And, um, and even to circle back to something that really got you into basketball, the 2K game. If you play a season, you can trade players that don't get traded. You can make yeah. your own super team. Um, and you can sort of operate within the same constraints that the league operates in. So it makes you feel like, you know, if everyone would just listen to me, we could win every title that we've ever needed <laughs> <laughs> yeah monday morning monday morning quarterbacking which you know it can, ends up similar to like ah the writers of this season did this if they had only followed this plot line instead right if they'd only asked me i could have really helped <laughs> right yeah i think the same stuff that you're talking about is the same stuff people talk about when it comes to fandom of television or movies or books which is a level of disassociation a level of obsession and large back catalog to go through and and sort of understand the lore of um and i really like the idea of the what ifs because there are so many different what ifs that you could talk about that even just in this kind of 40 minutes that we've been talking you can you can look at the different dominoes that had to fall to make the league what it is today so if steve kerr never plays with the bulls yeah does steve kerr become the steve kerr that can manage these levels of egos and do the Golden State Warriors become the Golden State Warriors? Does Steph instead become a solo kind of LeBron or Michael Jordan-esque figure? Um, there are so many different, like we've already, there we go. Now we have a new fan fiction for the NBA. Steve Kerr almost <laughs> coached the Knicks. He was this yeah. close to coaching the Knicks and, and Steph wanted to be drafted by the Knicks, not for that reason. Steph, Steph did not want to go to the Warriors when he was drafted. He was like, this kind of sucks, but okay. <laughs> you know? I'll take it. Um, yeah. And, you know, the draft is another pretty human element of the league, I would say, yeah. that people aren't necessarily super aware of, which is that even if you're the best player in the world, you could end up on a team that you don't want to be on. Yeah. Or even if you do, it's a bad situation, you know, and then yeah. you have squandered like Andrew Wiggins, standout player mm. for the Warriors last year. Prior to that, seen largely as a bust of a first overall pick because mm -hmm. of his time in Minnesota a historically, until very recently, dysfunctional organization. Yeah. And that can really mess with players' development. And that's not even considering things like health factors. You know, like Isaiah Thomas plays his heart out for the Celtics, messes up his hip. They ship him off for Kyrie next year. And that's the last time he's relevant in the league. Yeah. And like, that sucks. Yeah. But it's like our favorite characters and stories. These are compelling characters that you want to see what happens to them and how they develop and grow. And you get to see everything has a series finale. <laughs> everything gets a series finale, you know? Vince Carter plays for the Hawks and then rides off in the sunset doing a podcast or whatever. Right. Yeah, I think, and um, the league now, you know, something, you know, I think, I think a great, um, thing that you talked about earlier that we could dive into a little bit yeah. is the bubble season. Yeah. Because that was, I think, a time where you really got to see the humanity of those, of, I almost said those characters, um, <laughs> of those basketball players, of those people. Um, and I, I think a lot of times we didn't realize or necessarily recognize what it was saying, which was the ex expectation that these players were here to entertain even in a, a place that perhaps there were more important things going on. Yeah. Um, and going into that bubble meant they also left their families behind yeah. in this extreme period of time. Yeah, this was 2020. You know, we had there was we were far off from a vaccine, still learning the ins and outs of how coronavirus functions as a disease. Mm -hmm. And they put themselves at risk and they uprooted their lives. And tip to tail, everybody, you know, very few people who were eligible opted out. Yeah. And um, and because of that, we ended up seeing 
as much as it was weird to have no fans, we saw some of the highest level basketball, I think, that we've seen in a long time. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I think it was really interesting because for those who don't know, Disney World is what housed <laughs> um, the greatest basketball players of the year. Yeah. Uh, during corona and they lived at the disney world resort yep. and played games at the disney world resort with no fans um to an empty court um and they got tested every day and as we referenced earlier like some of these players made poor decisions and got, <laughs> such as ordering postmates um pretty sure lou but williams also- legit went to a strip club Yes. Okay. So it's very famous, but he he did pick up. Technically, he was home for some sort of family thing, yeah. and he got someone took a picture of him in a uh, strip club at home, <laughs> and he was like, "I was literally there to pick up wings," and everyone was like, "Dude, what?" And then a number of people had to be like, "No, they really are the best wings in town." <laughs> he was really there I to pick up wings Lula and leave so much. <laughs> Um, but you get those amazing moments of like someone was like, you know what? Like, I'm finally out of this bubble. I'm having the worst year of my life, like everyone else yeah. in this country and this war in the world. Yeah. Um, and I just want some fucking wings, like from my favorite place, which happens to be a strip club. Yeah. I don't know what to tell you. And you, it's these singular stories that also play into larger idea of each team being a faction. Like about the bubble, mm-hmm. it was really fun to see how the Miami Heat, a historically, you know, militaristic work ethic, work ethic team took like ducks to water to this heavily regimented closed mm. campus environment. And they made it to the NBA finals when they were not seen in any way as a finals favorite up to that point. And they yeah. thrived in that. Like Jimmy Butler, I'm up at three in the morning doing push-ups on the court. I'm like, Arr! and there's that picture <sighs> of him game six done as a human being, absolutely exhausted because he just yeah. gave everything he had. And it was not enough to beat LeBron James and Anthony Davis. Yeah. And that's a- another one of those moments that, was uh, great if you knew the history of the league yeah. and you know the history of LeBron because LeBron makes his first real push of his own super team at my, in Miami with Dwayne Wade mm-hmm. and those and Dwayne Wade's now retired and you've got sort of one of the original bromances yeah. of modern <laughs> NBA history um, and then you've got this up and coming young group of people that have finally kind of brought the heat back into the spotlight for the first time since LeBron left. Yeah. Um, and then you face off against each other and you can't win. And, and especially, you know, seeing this is almost l- lucky. Luckily for Jimmy Butler being the player that he is, he's had like peak sense. They were in the Eastern Conference Finals last year, the Miami Heat. But following his journey from the Bulls to the Minnesota Timberwolves, blowing that up, going to the Sixers, mm-hmm. blowing that up, and finally finding his <laughs> his like dudes on the edge of the edge uh, in mm-hmm. Miami of just like, what is this, a drill, ca- like, what is this, uh, uh, drill sergeant times? Yeah. I, I'm trying not just not to use the word psychotic work ethic, but like it's, dude is scary. Yeah. You know, there, he's intense, which also I think um, uh, the bubble was one of the first times that we saw the guys from the league be sort of human outside of a press conference yeah. because so many of them were on the internet in ways that you're like I was they were just as bored as we were yeah. um and Jimmy with his extreme level of a work ethic on that team and the level that he took his sport to he also was having a ridiculously fun time yeah. and is funny like <laughs> he had he started a coffee shop in his hotel room yes yeah which is now a coffee. brand of coffee <laughs> Yeah, it's like that was um that was so fun. Like I remember seeing those pictures of his sort of prices on his door every day <laughs> of um of you've got so you've got that, you've got like it was like what was it? It was like twenty dollars for a small, five dollars for a large, yeah. and like there was one day where one specific member of the team was written, but if you're this person, it's a hundred. Like yeah, Gor- Goran <laughs> Dragic had to pay a hundred dollars yeah. to get a cup of coffee. <laughs> Yeah. So it's like you got to see I I think that part of the league was really one of the moments that um, that they pulled away from that superhuman feeling of a great equalizer of everybody is going through this horrible period of life of covid. Um, And you got to see that humanity of those people, not of your players, because they weren't there. (laughs) (laughs) We we, we did okay. I I was better off. That was not a season to be there. 
Yeah, um, true. Yeah, and it it functions almost in the same way as like behind the scenes content, you know. And mm-hmm. I think if there is a benefit to this age of extreme access we have to these people, it's, it's at its best when it's things like that. Like Matisse Thibel, yeah. a rotation player for the 76ers, had like a pretty great vlog about what it's mm-hmm. like to do the bubble. And you hear like Donovan Mitchell tweeting about how, you know, Jamal Murray just dropped 50 on him and then he sees him like the next morning, like at like sort of the campus lunch, but it's like, hey, you know, <laughs> and like they just had this duel where they would trade dropping 50 burgers on each other. And it's just like, and it's like school. They, the next day they're just like, yeah. well, you're here. There's no, we're just here. So we're all just here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I do wonder what it's like for people to be at that peak level and then also have to deal with each other. Like the next morning, yeah. I don't know that I. <laughs> yeah, feel that good. it's like I know it's just a game, but like, dang, man. <laughs> um, did you engage in all of that stuff? Did you like get into Matisse's YouTube channel and the level of kind of? I mean, there were players on TikTok. There were players, um, getting in trouble for flying drones for their content. <laughs> yeah, I forgot because <laughs> they are, you know, they're big. They're big children, <laughs> most yeah. of them. Um, yeah, um, no joke throughout that period of time from the summer of 2019 up through the end of last season, in a large way, the NBA kind of saved my life. Game six of the NBA finals in 2019, uh, Raptors versus Warriors. Warriors are down three, two, trying to force a game seven, um, to take it back to, uh, I think Toronto. Yeah. And it looks like it's working. They have this like old warriors magic that pops off, you know, like one we dig deep and find one more push. <laughs> and then uh Clay Thompson goes up uh with for contested layup and tears his ACL. Mm. And I mean, kudos to that dude. Came back out, shot his free throws because he didn't know what what the prognosis was yet. And up to that point, he was and I, it still is my favorite basketball player. Something about him and the way that, you know, he can be a little petty at times, but like you hear about China Clay and like the, the the way he is for the fans and he just lives his own life and he hangs out with his dog and goes on his boat and just like has a good time and is like just kind of down to chill and is also one of the greatest shooters of the basketball in NBA history. Hard to root against that guy. Yeah. You know, you're just like it's, his Q rating is pretty much like the high, you know, and like the stories of like he signs a kid's toaster because he's like, all right, sure, whatever. Then they go on a 24 game win streak or some shit like or 14 yeah. game win streak. And just stuff like that, you know, you're like, this guy's great. I love him. And to see him go down was was uh, rough, you know, as somebody who's a big fan of him. Uh, three weeks later, I get in a car accident on my way to interview at a music school that fundamentally changes my life. Um, it kicked off what I know now was a nervous system disorder that ended up making it impossible for me to play instruments, do any kind of load bearing exercise or generally have normal function of my hands and arms without extreme prolonged pain for three years. Mm -hmm. Uh, I thought at many points my life was, if not over, severely different. I was considering how I would keep going, having to redesign my life from the ground up in terms of what I wanted for my career or even just how to function in general. Um, And throughout those really dark times, considering it was also COVID. Like, yeah. I remember in like December 2020 making like a running list of like the top eight reasons that, that I like that like are the, the people that like, what, what, what am I? What am I as a person? You know, like what are the things mm-hmm. that make me feel like me? And it was just listing stuff. And like, I think like number one through eight were just absolutely out of the question, mm-hmm. which included things like going to shows and things like that. And, you know, playing instruments, uh, sucking at basketball. Um, like, you know, load bearing exercise, all this stuff. And I was like, wow, first off, this was a bad idea. Second off, what can I do to keep me from like walking into the ocean, like straight up? Yeah. And I didn't know at that point. And it was also a a categorically pretty bad time to have a non COVID illness or like problem medically as a physical therapist once told me over the phone at at, like a telehealth appointment. They're like, yeah, you picked a bad time to go through this. I'm like, thanks. Oh, good. Yeah. (laughs) Um. And uh, one of the things that kept me going was just the NBA because it started again and there was all this stuff to lean into and to learn about and just to disassociate. I I keep using that word because it was important to me and I'd use it before. It's like, yeah, it's a trauma response. It's avoidance. But 
sometimes you got to do what you got to do to get by and to invest brain power into learning about the, the, the league and the way the bubble functioned and investing in these players' lives. And like mm-hmm. I said, I could give as much of myself as I wanted to these players and this league and these things, and they didn't ask for a single thing from me, which is something that I, you know, have come to value in like hobbies and skills and interests because that's, you know, and that's just, this isn't therapy. That's for later. Um, <laughs> once things started to move in general, you know, and as I was still going through this journey of trying to figure out what the fuck was wrong with me, you know, because I had always been fine. And then I get hit by a car one day. All of a sudden, everything sucks. But nobody can figure out what's going on. You know, that was, I think that's the important piece is that doctor after doctor, specialist after specialist. And those of you, if anyone listening has suffered from a chronic illness or chronic pain or had just indescribable, you know, uh, like ailments, it can be pretty undermining. And for as much as I've had a lot of things up in the air throughout my life, my physical self was always something I could depend on. And it was like sort of, you know, if nothing else, that was like, I've got me as a person, a physical person. And to have that buckle was debasing on a human level. Clay Thompson's recovery, first from his ACL, and then unfortunately, right before the 2020 draft and the pickup game, he blows out his Achilles on the left side. Part of that was because the team, the Golden State Warriors, had essentially given him carte blanche. Like, hey, you've been with us for a decade, like pretty much tied to our hip, and we've had a big role in your life. If you need some space, that's cool. You know, and he took that. And who's to say, again, like fan fiction, if he would have had the same second catastrophic injury had he been with the team through his ACL rehab process. But he goes from tearing his ACL, coming all the way back, tearing his Achilles, coming all the way back. And throughout this time i'm going through this thing where i can't do what i want either i can't you know <laughs> it's funny uh it, it was almost i actually ended, ended up getting second degree uh connection where my one of my roommates at the time uh beth may had uh had surgery on her wrist and was doing uh physical therapy at like a kaiser center in downtown and mm-hmm. she was going to go into like an elevator and they were like oh can you hold on a second and it was like a film crew and they were doing a Kaiser <laughs> spot and it was clay on crutches going into an elevator. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, <laughs> that's funny. Um, but like clay doesn't know me. I don't know him. Yeah. It really, yeah. you know, and I'm not like, but like there was something so there was a sense of camaraderie of this, this singular person that I had already been so invested in went through what hit me as somewhat of a parallel experience having your livelihood and your interests and the only thing that kind of matters to you or the things that matter to you ripped away in such an isolating way where it's singular you know and it's kind of just you against the world it can feel like that sometimes in a time of extreme isolation which was covid and i remember in january of this last year after 930 odd days um he makes his debut against the Cavaliers. I was up in Southern Oregon visiting family and I was like, hey gang, uh, I know that like dinner is now, but like I'm watching this fucking basketball game. Yeah. <laughs> and like I cried. I I melted. Yeah. To, to see that. And that was also, luckily for me, a somewhat of a turning point in my own recovery where I was able to ascertain after, you know, I saw it. I went to I went to this uh, uh, Alex Friedman. Love the guy. West LA Hand Center. Like the only place, you, the last place you're going to go. Had every test, scan thing you can imagine done. He's like, look, man, I don't know what to tell you. There's nothing that I could do that would, outside of exploratory surgery. Mm-hmm. So throughout January and, and opening myself up to like, you know, what one would argue are like almost alternative treatment methods like acupuncture, like um, somatic therapy and like uh, a lot of like other stuff was able to put into place what people had been telling me in like little ways throughout my recovery of like, Hey, this sounds like it could be a nervous system disorder. This sounds like it could be a hyperactivity of your nervous system. You may just have been living in an unsustainable way for 27 years. And this finally broke it. Like, Hey, maybe Mm. it's not your arms, like chill the, like, Hey, Hey, Hey. And, uh, was able to basically kind of turn that ship around for real in May of this last year, we're at around playoff time. And, to get to the end of the NBA Finals in June and see Clay Thompson give as best he could some kind of summation, holding the Larry O'Brien Trophy of what it meant to him to go through this three-year period of um, recovery and poor health for very specific issues. He tore his ACL, he tore his Achilles, and what that was like to come back to the mountaintop, so to speak. And then at the same time, having 
at that point basically broken through this wall that had ruined my life. And I thought that in at many points in time, it was effectively over, at least for what I had, how I'd envisioned it. And at the same time, learning so much about myself and learning what the value of a baseline existence is, like you are not what you, as much as you are what you love, at the same time, I'm really glad I know that I'm not now. Yeah. I'm so thankful to be able to get the idea through my thick fucking skull that your value as a human being and your um, validity as an existing life is not determined by the things you can produce or associate yourself with or accomplish, which is something I believed but hadn't internalized. That moment was special. And because of that, how could I not be devoted to this sport? Yeah, I think that's, I really appreciate you sharing because I think that's a really, a really beautiful kind of one of those moments where real life mirrors celebrity life. And like it's one of those things where you kind of think about like the fact that there's so many people on the planet that it, sometimes your story is happening to someone else at the same time. Yeah. It's the same on like a on less um, dramatic level. Like why do airplanes work? Because <laughs> this many people need to go from one city to this next city on the same date. Huh. And something about that is mind blowing to think that that many people to fill up a plane multiple times a day need to go to the same place from the same place. But for Clay to be experiencing exactly or not exactly, obviously, it's a completely different injury. Um, but it is a level of watching someone who is at kind of the height of their career and their experience get knocked down by something that arguably happened completely out of his control like those those tears and those injuries are not you made a mistake or you you moved or you did something wrong or you put you did something dumb it's it hits you just like a car can hit you yeah. on the street and i i really love the the kind of mirroring of that and being able to like you say you don't have to give anything to the league but it does sound like the league gives a lot back to you yeah it it, it really does um especially throughout that time and for that i'm honestly forever like not indebted to it but it's like yeah i'm a lifelong fan because that may change my investment level in each individual season may change especially it's interesting now being invested invested for around seven years mm -hmm. i feel kind of like i'm going through my first like changing of the of the guard in the league you know we start to see players retire there's this idea of mm. lebron james is not a uh inevitable you know retiring is is not a eternal entity even staff people talk about how he's old and like he's 35 yeah. and like, yeah. yeah he's <laughs> and like you see, you know, not even just like the Lucas and the Giannis, but like, uh, you know, now Paolo Banchero and uh, Bancaro and like, uh, you know, Jalen Green. And you're like, mm -hmm. oh, I see the ecosystem. And that's to me, that's kind of beautiful. Yeah, it's something that whether the individuals remain the same, which they physically can't, yeah. it, it remains still a staple and a a thing that will always be there pretty solidly, I think. And you really start to understand, you know, stereotypical idea of it is like your dad's friends who has a jersey, a signed jersey hung up on the wall. And it's like, and even if, if not a sports fan, like that seems dumb. It's like that is a representation of all of the emotions that this person evoked in the person that has this piece of memorabilia. Yeah. I think also one of the other things that you talked about in that is the idea of not just being what you can produce. Yeah. And I wonder for you if clay during his injuries he did some commentating like he yeah. played around with other things like was it cool to get to watch him also do things that showed that he was still clay he was still of value even though he couldn't get on the court a hundred hundred thousand percent you know and to see because those kind of you know we've all been through stuff where we feel not ourselves yeah and to see that despite the circumstances and you would only imagine and there's been reporting on how bad it got for him we can all mm -hmm. relate to things like that the fact he's like but you know what this is still life and i'm still you know he's able to just kind of you see more of him as a person you know um yeah no it's great it's absolutely it's like great this is a data point and why this is all going to be okay yeah yeah and he's uh he in particular is a silly goofy guy yeah. i would say like he's got like you know yeah. some fun things looks like squidward's um, house it's funny yeah. <laughs> um, I actually, Clay in particular, I have really like fond feelings for because my, uh, my, so we're a Golden State Warriors household as well. Nice. But, uh, we have, uh, we've moved from team to team, I would say. Mm -hmm. So we did, we were Golden State fans pre KD, mm -hmm. but arguably you could still call it bandwagoning 
I would say. 15 on, um, it's, and you know, if we're being honest in the court of NBA law, it's bandwagoning, and that's okay. Yeah, but it's also like, how could you not want to be a fan of that team? That's the thing I feel, is like, when you watch that team play, even pre-KD, there's no, uh, there's, there's no, you can't watch that and be like, eh, okay, I hope they lose, yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it, it becomes a, I don't like this because it's good and popular. Yes, exactly. It's, uh, yeah, I think you just have to, you have to enjoy it. Yeah. But um, my dad travels a lot for work and he was in a hotel and I, the, the Warriors happened to also be in the same hotel, oh. um, which he found out in the middle of the night going, I don't know even know where, I don't know where he was going because I wasn't there, but I just receive with no context a f- selfie of my dad and Clay Thompson in the elevator, just a selfie of the two of them. Um, and I was like, dude, what the, like, what, what, <laughs> what is this? And he was like, yeah, we were just in the, Clay says hi. Um, but he's the kind of guy that, like, apparently, we talked about it later, and just, like, my my dad's uh, whole thing was, he really doesn't get, like, celebrity-centric about things. Mm-hmm. But he was like, I'm riding the elevator with Clay Thompson, and said to him, which is such a dad thing to say, um, my daughter is a huge fan of yours. Not we're huge fans. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter is a huge fan of yours and uh she would kill me if i didn't at least ask for a picture which is true um but they took the picture and it was like a gracious he's just a gracious guy yeah you know yeah and well, it comes through yeah. you know and like whether it's on ig live him on his boat and he's yeah. like you know on the way to the championship raid and like he loses his captain's hat and he's like oh no <laughs> oh well and then puts on a second hat it's just like hey, guy come on you know, he blows yeah. a dunk in China and he's like, ah, whatever. <laughs> YOLO. Uh, yeah, he's just got it. I think also that whole team, like him and Steph yeah. and and Draymond to a to degree as well. They're all just having fun. Like there's there's an extreme seriousness about the game, but it's also wonderful to watch them and to listen to them talk after because mm-hmm. there's a joy in that game that you hope for from someone who's getting paid millions of dollars to play a playground game. Yeah. Yeah, and it can feel, you know, you see a championship parade and they're all up there taking turns at the podium speaking and it can feel a little like, okay, maybe we're all a little too, uh, mm. you know, uh, like into this as a collective as these guys that play basketball hold court over like a couple hundred thousand people or something. But at the same time, like, it's characters. We love stories. Yeah. And they did it. They came through, you know, in their case specifically, like they came through what felt like insurmountable odds and they they fucking won again Mm -hmm. and the people that won on their team are these compelling individuals that you want to hear from because you're like ooh, how are they going to react to this or that it's yeah it's it's like great tv it's great tv yeah 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 and i think um uh not to bring it back to my favorite player michael jordan but um (laughs) i do think like there's a level of the players that become iconic are the ones that recognize it is a team sport. So even when you look back at Michael Jordan and you look at him as this massive prolific being who won every game all by himself, that's never what he said. Mm -hmm. Like in terms of press, and it's still not what he says when he talks about it. He's openly acknowledged that there were multiple seasons where he didn't have the team that he needed. And regardless of how well he played, they still lost because you can't play one person against five. There, um, I'm reading Phil Jackson's Eleven Rings right now, which is a pretty mm. pretty solid book so far. And he talks about those early Bulls seasons that he coached, you know, in like the the '91 season and like kind of his journey up to that point. And Phil Jackson's like an old hippie, basically, and he gets into these yeah. ideas of like commu- communicating to the team that they need to become a Stage Five tribe. And if that's not the most anime shit I've heard of <laughs> in my entire life, first of all, but it's this idea <laughs> of like uh, an, an individual versus like an individual versus an individual versus like a group versus a group versus like a group just acting for the sake of each other as opposed to against yeah. somebody and um and talks about how with michael jordan there was a there was a conversation over a couple of years to get this idea across to him like hey this is going to work a whole fucking lot better if we get these other guys involved and then michael jordan also then you know agreeing communicating yeah but can they fucking play right you know and it's it's a story, but it really happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's like when you look at it, it's like, yeah, okay, fine. I'll pass the ball, but what good is passing the ball if they can't shoot it? Yeah. And 
I thought it was I I yeah I love it and I I did love watch watching the last dance which obviously is is cut to a certain perspective sure. um but I do think like watching it and listening to him talk about how Scotty Pippen and Dennis Rodman there's not a bulls without all three of them yeah there's not that dynasty without all three of them yeah and you see that you know <laughs> to bring the focus back to the Warriors this is after all Warriors <laughs> podcast now um it's that same idea Steph Clay and Draymond not you know in their in their different ways because they're three of them are, are each drastically different from one they're all shorter than um you know, <laughs> MJ Scotty and Rodman but you know I feel like Rodman is kind of the clay as much as you could say he's the Draymond but like he kind of does the the singular things like clay just shoots mm. the shit out of the ball and guards perimeter guys at least he used to mm-hmm. and then Draymond is that Scotty of like kind of the engine of a lot of this offense and like it doesn't like Steph has some of the greatest on off metrics which is to say that when he's on the court the team is better than when he is off the court of any player in history but like yeah Steph doesn't work as well without Draymond. And Draymond certainly doesn't fucking work without Steph. Right. Yeah, I think that team really is like, they give you this, every piece of them are is necessary and i think one of the best examples of that is when draymond got um suspended yeah um it was a disaster yeah <laughs> it was 2016 nba disaster. finals draymond green punches lebron james in the nuts and the league says that's enough damn it <laughs> that that right there is specifically enough allegedly allegedly, allegedly. <laughs> i'm still heated over that um yeah yeah i think uh i think to to compare it to like the last dynasty that we talked about back then there wasn't social media Mm -hmm. there wasn't as much of an extreme there was an extreme like media response around the bulls and around what they were doing and around michael jordan and an extreme amount of pressure and i'll never say that there wasn't but i think there's a different kind of pressure now where you're watching these players who are extremely good and there is less speculation and more ability to find the truth of if they have a fight in the locker room, like someone can someone can be standing outside live streaming it and recording it. Oh, remember the Rockets uh, Thunder? Was it Rock? No, Rockets Rockets Clippers tunnel fight. Yeah, Chris Paul. Oh my God. Who? <laughs> Subterfuge. But espionage. I, I wonder how much of that leads to your ability to really get into it like if you want to talk about history you've got to go and read one of the 17 biographies written by sam smith about michael jordan or (laughs) (laughs) or read phil jackson's book or watch the last dance it's all very editable and curatable and they can tell you exactly what you want to know and so you only remember these big highlights yeah um but now your ability to kind of do you think that extreme level of connection and being able to deal with like Twitter and Instagram and TikTok and these YouTube channels and everything is what gives you the ability to deeply disassociate into this? Yes, especially in the nature that you can pick and choose the kind of content you're giving your brain over to. Like um, mm-hmm. I have become really big on like like salary cap and like how teams are built yeah. and um, you know how players are going to factor into like the team's roster for that year and to answer your question yes absolutely and i think what helps it from becoming overwhelming is you can kind of pick your poison of do you like the drama do you like the theory Mm. do you like the the absolute just drudgery of salary cap um yeah yeah i have no point (laughs) well i think um i think it's been cool to talk about really like the level of how much there is that's such a great really as you go through that yeah. like losing your point in the fact that there's just too many different ways to get into basketball yeah, you can just um, google highlight like a uh, best hundred shot ever and like that's entertaining too whatever you know yeah or like yeah. hey i want to know how and why vince carter in the 2000 olympics dunked over this french dude so hard that the new york knicks pulled his contract offer and he never played professional basketball again yeah. Yeah. There's so many like deep dive facts. And you could also honestly, like I would say um, the TNT after or halftime show with Shaq and um, and Charles Barkley. I, you could watch that by itself. It's, like you don't need to know what's it's happening. It's one of my favorite shows on television. <laughs> Inside the NBA is incredible. And that's another that's a whole other angle to it. You have it's like if, you know, in a show that reboots like all, like the Power Rangers or a reality show like Survivor. They would do what they do sometimes in the way they have a post show with like former cast members or whatever. The these old these retired players are still alive and now more than ever their presence in the media. JJ Reddick podcast. Yeah. He was the first one to get Ben Simmons to talk about why he wouldn't dunk that shit. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's like that's great. Yeah, 
yeah, and you've got you've just got like legends. It's it is it is interesting how you can watch these legends go from legends so like playing basketball and and to then be commentating and talking to the young guys and there was a stretch of time where Draymond was on um inside the NBA and that was really cool to watch yeah. um those two generations of people and and we're getting further and further into the media and the game being one in the same and the fact that Draymond Green while being an active player in the NBA has a media deal with Turner mm -hmm. like he has a contract and he's a he's a yeah. uh commentator or whatever a personality for them Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is I, I, I don't want to be wrong, but I do think that's the first time it's been an active player doing both. Yeah, which is really cool to watch. And and if you were gonna watch someone do it, I would watch Graham do it. So throw that uh, out there. <laughs> um, I, I I feel the wrap up tone of this, and I agree. But I also need to know because I've just run my mouth for an hour and a half. What what what's your NBA moment? What was your what was your I've been NBA pilled moment? If you have one. Mine is Space Jam. No shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. When I was a kid, I was obsessed with Space Jam um, to the point that, you know how they make those like that kid furniture? Yes. Where you can like, okay, so I had a Space Jam couch that was like child sized. I think I was like three. And I used to sit on it and watch Space Jam over and over and over again. It's so tight. Um, yeah. My, and my dad loved basketball growing up. And like, I've always been really close with my dad. And, um, I think Space Jam was like, I still watch it. And I now as an adult look back on it and I'm like, this was such, if I had been an adult that was aware of the NBA when this movie came out, I would have thought it was so brilliant because you've got Michael Jordan who, if you want to talk about drama of, the, of, of a good story, has gone through and done the impossible three times, mm -hmm. then was like, ah, I don't feel like it anymore. I want to do something else and goes and plays baseball, which a lot of people laugh at and make a joke out of. But when you listen to people talk about him training for baseball, they all have objectively said like the people that he trained with were like if he had stayed, he would have become one of the best baseball players of all time. Yeah. He was completely training into a new he rebuilt his body muscle from group. the ground up. Yeah. Exactly. And you watch him do that and then you watch him return. He's decided he's going to return back to the NBA and do it again. And they made a movie that takes away the very sad version of it, which is that he lost his dad and there was a lot of emotional stuff going on and, and there's a lot of history there and a lot of horrible stuff where he's being blamed for it. And there's a lot of media fodder saying that his gambling problem is why his dad was killed and, and all of these different things. Um, and it's just a gruesome, horrible media thing. And instead, they're like, um, actually, Michael was sucked into the Looney Tunes universe, played a superhero game with the Monstars, and realized that he really did love basketball. You know <laughs> he's going back. Wow. That's um, an insane pivot from like a PR perspective. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, it's brilliant. And also then you look and you watch like what was actually going on. And he was not only training to play about he was playing basketball on set. They yeah. built him a basketball court in which he could train to go back to the NBA and re remain himself and the insane player that he was and then was filming all day. The evil um, genius that he is. Yes. And then you also have, I mean, the genius and the cool, cool, cool factor. Like, I don't know how many people our age are necessarily connected to Charles Barkley, but I love Charles Barkley. And part of that is because he was in Space Jam. <laughs> I was just about to say, I think maybe my favorite part of the story, which is altogether great, but the fact that there was a three-year-old that was that acutely aware of Charles Barkley. <laughs> Yes, I'm obsessed with him. I love, I watch all of his appearances on Shark Tank. I love Charles Barkley. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, got, I didn't know. I got to look those up. Oh my yeah, God. This is, uh, oh, oh, he does some great appearances on Shark Tank. You want to really enjoy yourself? He, him and Mark Cuban have a great time. I'm very, very thrilled about it. Uh, yeah, I think, I think also part of that is why I love the drama of the NBA yeah. because that even at the time not be processing what it was it was this intense level of of story and ridiculousness yeah. um but it's just as heightened as the real nba is i feel the same way watching games now um and i was a big lebron fan when i when i got uh when i understood the nba cuz we were living in florida at the time so we were watching miami heat games and my dad grew up in la so he grew up as a massive Lakers fan. Mm -hmm. And then the Shaq and Kobe stuff went down mm -hmm. and therefore we were not allowed to be a Lakers house anymore. Interesting. We left with Shaq. Yes. 
big, big uh, line in the sand. So we followed Shaq to Miami, where he and Dwayne Wade became an amazing duo of teams, uh, of duo of players. Mm-hmm. And then that title, watching oh, them. six? Yeah. That was, a, yeah. Uh, was it six? Yeah, I think it was. I think it was because I was living in LA when they had won. Right so I think it was 2006. Um, and I have the hat actually from that championship. Wow. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, I think I, but I still, the players that I've loved or the teams that I've loved connect back to the same thing that made me love Space Jam, which is that they always have a good story and like a good friendship behind, whether they're actually friends or not, they might hate each other, but I believe. <laughs> I'm just remembering the, Post game seven, LeBron's house party, there were cookies that were made to look like headstones of Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, and Draymond Green. Yeah. <laughs> Just like, damn. It's like, it's enough. I mean, it's and enough, that's, guys. you know, that's still kind of corny, but like, I'm like, yeah, no, that was real animosity. Yeah. 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 And I, I do think, like, I, I just think it's so fun, like, to watch a game that objectively like you played in in elementary school mm-hmm. like everyone had to play a basketball unit for yeah. PE at some point yeah. right but then watching people play it to such a degree that like it doesn't matter if I'm with a group of people I'm at the game or I'm at home watching on my laptop like I I spent so many games in my college dorm by myself screaming at the top of my lungs ah. watching it on my laptop um there's just like a level of excitement when it comes through well, and because the 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 ma- the way that you win at this game is inherently anticipation because the ball mm-hmm. goes up and you hope it goes in yeah you know yeah and it's non-stop and like a lot of sports are not that way football baseball like there's a lot of waiting before something exciting happens yep. basketball is non-stop tension until the last two minutes 40 minutes an absolute drag yeah, then then it's over. It's, well, sometimes you get a great game. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, no, no. true, 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 true. And they're they're getting rid of the take foul this year. We're gonna see how that goes. Do you have a moment? Do you have the NBA moment that's like, fuck, that's it. God. That's uh, so. I used to go to Spark games with my grandfather. Tight. And uh, I was in the Staples Center when the first woman dunked in an NBA game. Holy and shit. That was, fucking amazing people do not give the WNBA enough attention and it can be just as fucking exciting and it was amazing I am absolutely um, part of that problem and I'm, I'm I intend to change that this year if I can so help me God <laughs> you know, it was it was this moment where like the entire arena was like holy shit did that just happen like it was it was amazing it was so so cool and I do remember that vividly because that summer was the first time that I played basketball. Like I went to a, um, I went to a Sparks intensive that like you got to play with the players, um, and their coach was uh, Kobe Bryant's dad. So I played like I got to learn basketball from them. I was like a kid and, and had no idea what I was doing, but they were all very nice, very <laughs> intense, um, and obviously playing at this insane level but it was definitely that was my basketball moment of realizing like getting to watch women do it and getting to watch women do something that was so intensely celebrated that everyone was like this has never happened before was it felt like being a part of history so okay it's definitely that is. Yeah. you were that's cool <laughs> okay so i think i am gonna ask you our our final question Great. which is uh which is if you had never gotten into the NBA mm-hmm. or the Golden State Warriors at all, what would be different about you as a person? Hmm. I wouldn't be as annoying to my roommates probably because I wouldn't be using the TV mm-hmm. so much uh, from the months of October to June. Um, what would be different about me as a person? I think, you know, I would have been able to fill this void with something else, mm-hmm. but I think I would have missed out on as somebody who is, uh, like yourself, historically more of an artist than an athlete, um, spent, you know, much less so athlete to me from like an organized standpoint, I would have missed out on, I think, what is the joy of like professional sports and what they can do to bring people together. And that it's like a really outsized, you know, way to present like a multi-billion dollar industry that has as many dark sides as it has bright spots. But um yeah, what would I be doing instead? Just still, I don't know, just like I would be listening to more music than NBA pods, I guess. <laughs> I think I, yeah. something would have found its way in there, but I'm really glad it was the NBA that did. 
Yeah. 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 I think um, when you pitched the episode topic, you called it the Steph episode, but I think it's more apt to call it the Clay episode, the, Cl- <laughs> the Thompson episode. Cl- um, hmm. We'll figure this out. <laughs> uh, my Claytheist manifesto. Uh, there we go. I like that. I, that works for me. Yeah. I and friendships. I have people that I kind of that were acquaintances that became de- like. I have this friend in uh, New York. His name's Jack. He's a wonderful human being. He let me sleep on his couch for two weeks in July when I came to like just hang out in New York. Like we met through music, like Warped Tour stuff. He was a journalist at this website called AbsolutePunk.net when I was recording an album with like a mid-card Warped Tour band when I was doing that for like six months in 2011. And like we became acquaintances and like we're friends on Twitter-ish and he's the world's only Clipper fan. So we just like he tweeted something about the NBA and we just started talking and then became great friends. And then he gave me his extra ticket to Clippers Suns Western Conference Finals Game three, like in the 100 section last year. And like and through that and just like it just opens doors for human connection. And it's a collective experience because it's fandom. And that's exactly what this is about, you know. Yeah, I think the best part about the the league and the sport in general is that it does bring people together. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's been happening even before, like far before Michael Jordan. Um, yeah. Like my grandfather grew up in uh, in Philly. And so he went to Overbrook, huh. which is where some of the best. I mean, that's where Wilt Chamberlain went. That's, that's, that's also ABA, where went. like Dr. Yeah. J. Uh, uh. Exactly. And so like you can you have these moments where like, you have these people who can go from being just someone who was in town. Like my grandfather grew up in the same town and knows Will Chamberlain or knew Will Chamberlain and wow. played ping pong with him. Um, and he's just a kid down the block. Like I can't, I like he talks about him in the way that like you talk about like that annoying kid three blocks over that you grew up with. Um, and I think it's one of the few things that you really can still like we talk a lot about nepotism in the industry of entertainment and in a number of other industries and all of the different things that get in your way to be able to uh, to compete in a professional way. Mm-hmm. And it feels like basketball is one of the few things that remains like you actually can have those American dream stories where you can just be a kid that grew up in West Philly and actually become one of the greatest people to ever play the game. Yeah. You see, uh, you know, like this year, uh, Adam Sandler's Hustle, uh, Netflix original, pretty good. Mm -hmm. But like, that's a story that I'm lucky enough to have a friend that um, was able to provide some insight into this. He's an NFL player, and he's somebody who has been competing for a spot in the the National Football League for Mm -hmm. a couple of years now. And like been, you know, sort of on the edge of a roster to the practice squad and back. And like the entire narrative that you find with uh, Adam Sandler's Hustle, where um, Juancho Hernan Gomez plays this guy, Bo Cruz, who like is an international prospect they find. And he's like trying to get his way into the league and this whole thing. Like that's just a lot of these dudes lives yeah. to the G League, to playing overseas, to, you know, the, the league is is the goal. That is that's the when you're there, like you've achieved it. That's the mountaintop. And a lot of these guys, you know, we love and we know and we celebrate the stars. but um, so much of the drama happens on the fringes of guys doing camp tryouts, roster spots, and like, uh, yeah, it's it's all it's all compelling. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Um, well, thank you so much, Travis. I had a lot of fun. I don't get to talk about the NBA as much as I would like to, so <laughs> I had a lot of fun, and I appreciate you joining in. Between now and next Wednesday, if you want to keep in touch, you can follow me on social media at Marissa Kamari, anywhere you get your social media fix. You can also sign up for my newsletter by going to our website, tandemproductions.com, clicking on You Are What You Love and signing up there. I send out an issue with every episode of this podcast. And we just started a Discord server. So if you want to connect with me, with other listeners, and talk about the types of things that we are talking about on this show, you can join that by clicking on the link in the episode description. Until next Wednesday, I hope you are enjoying what you love.